We are your home theater and AV questions answered. This is AV Rant. Want your home theater or AV question answered by Tom and Rob? Send it to question at avrant.com. Welcome to another edition of AV Rant. I'm Tom Mandry and I'm here with... Rob H., this is AV Rant. It's your home theater and AV questions answered. And uh, welcome back, Tom. You were off last week. Uh, Lee Overstreet filled in, so very much thanks to Lee once again. I got a fantastic uh, thumbnail from YouTube. The the YouTube gods smiled upon us once uh, again with Lee's face. I did see that. I also noticed that the, your his audio cut out after a while. Did you just keep going after he I went to I just kept bed? going after a while. I kept going for another 15 minutes or so. He had to go. It's so weird. <laughs> All right. The whole point of the podcast is a conversation, but what? It was one more person's question. I wanted to get to it. All right. We'll see how long this podcast is going to go because I got uh, stuff to do, and this took us an hour to get, to yep, get going. To get going. That's yep. that's not good. All right. This is AV Rant, the podcast that answers your home theater AV questions. Get your questions answered. All you have to do is ask. You ask by emailing us at a question at avrant.com. I was off a week. Uh-huh. <laughs> I can't remember it already. You go to <laughs> www.avrant.com and leave us a comment there. Facebook.com slash avrant podcast. YouTube.com slash avrant where you can see the apparently only the unfinished videos because the finished videos don't get any views <laughs> for whatever reason. It's about it's a, about equal, but the, the, the unfinished behind the scenes ones get more than the finished ones. But it's because it comes out earlier and people watch it and yeah. There you go. That's why I think we should just nix those. But whatever. Okay. Uh, like we've got you can contact us directly, Rob at avrant.com. His Twitter is at first reflect. I'm Tom at avrant.com. My Twitter is at avrant underscore Tom. And somebody followed me this week, which I was Ooh. shocked by. <laughs> wow. <laughs> it's just, you, you looked at my recent post history and went, This is a man who's got his, pul- his finger on the pulse of the nation. I'm hey, going to follow him. You do post regularly, at least once a week. Once a week. Yeah, usually. All right. So I want to thank our listeners of the week. To become a listener of the week, all you have to do is support the podcast in some way. One of the ways you can do that is go into www.avrant.com. Click on the Buy Us a Cup of Coffee link, and that will take you to a PayPal donation site. You can use your PayPal account or a credit card, which PayPal will process, and we will never see the number of. And uh, they will send most of the monies to us and keep a little, little slice for themselves. And we want to thank Paul and Gregory for doing that over the last two weeks. Yes, Paul, Gregory, thank you both very much for those donations. We also want to thank our 73 patrons over at Patreon.com. Patreon.com is a service where you can sign up for a monthly uh, like a donation to a group of uh, or a single content creator. You can split it up however you like. Uh, minimum for each content creator is a dollar. So if you would like to support us with a dollar a month, or more. You could do that. Or more. <laughs> yeah. Patreon.com slash AV Rant Podcast if you'd like so to So somebody sign up. asked me and I, if a dollar a month yep. from Patreon right. is more or less than $12 in one shot from At PayPal. PayPal. Mm-hmm. And I guess I would have to know that what they, that I think the take from Patreon is a little bit more. I might be wrong about that. I don't know. We'll I mean, it's to, a percentage. It's so. a percentage. So it should be, whichever the percentage is the lowest right. is the one that we would want. So I think pay, PayPal is better. <laughs> it's probably <laughs> very close. It, it's it's within a couple of pennies. Yeah. So whatever whatever floats your boat do yeah all right if you can't support the podcast financially you can do so and and you do so in some other way just let us know what it is so we can thank you so we're going to thank terry who bought a jvc rs 540 which is the same thing as a 790 projector from projectorpeople.com he talked quite a while with their national sales rep about av rant about how much we've helped him he chatted with several people and always found them helpful and when he had a question they weren't able to answer, they got him in touch with the rep from JVC, who spent a lot of the time on the phone with Terry and was extremely helpful. Terry was convinced to go with the RS540 because the JVC rep was very honest that even though the new uh, NX7 model costs four grand more, it's actually a slightly lower contrast and slightly higher black level than the RS540. So slightly higher black levels, huh? Yep. Yeah, so it's 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 not it's not quite as black and the contrast isn't quite as high, but it's eight thousand dollars versus the RS five forty's four thousand dollar now price tag. So uh, yeah, was still liking that RS five forty, also known as the X seven ninety in JVC's lineup. It's the Wobble K model, but you're actually getting the deeper black levels and the higher contrast for four thousand dollars less. All right, not bad. And uh, Patrick on Facebook, let us know that our podcast feed on Google Music hasn't updated since October first. When I looked at that, it had. Oh. I, I looked at it immediately after I saw that. Yep. So um, 
I think Google's just stupid. <laughs> I, I, I'd be, I mean, I'm whatever's going you. on with YouTube Live, I have no idea what's happening behind the scenes there. So Yeah, so uh, yeah, Google just occasionally stops updating the podcast, and then they all update at once. Eh. So uh, We also want to thank uh, 2A for the website and Lee for uh, being uh, filling in for me last week when I was busy with a puking child. Yes, how, how is your son? Is he doing all right? He's fine. He's fine. Okay, he's fine. that's good. Yeah, and our, our website stayed up the entire month of October, so I'm going to assume 2A fixed it. I think so, too. <laughs> Thank you, guys. In the news, uh, so there was a pair. Uh, I, I, am I getting this, too, or is it just you? I'm a little confused. I'm the <laughs> only one who got a tracking number, so I think they're only coming to me. All right, well, there you go. A pair of SVS Prime wireless speakers are on their way for Rob to review. So if you've seen them online, they've been advertising them all over Facebook and stuff like that. So they look pretty cool to me. Yeah, so I'm, I like I'm the looks. I'm, I'm hoping that uh, they'll be useful to my parents because I need to upgrade their TV listening situation. It's it's not cutting it right now with a hmm. the Vizio soundbar, which is nice enough, but uh, can't get loud enough and stuff like that. And it's kind of old. And they've kind of like turned it up so loud so many times that now it crackles. <laughs> so <laughs> they they need something. Yeah, I'm hoping. All right. So Rob was also a guest on the Entertainment 2.0 podcast with Josh Pollard and Richard Gunther last week, where they talked about how Red Dead Redemption 2 is faking HDR. Uh-huh. That's exciting, I guess. And it looks better if you set the game console to output only STR. That should, that should make a lot of gamers real happy. Biggest game yeah. of the year. Yep. It's, uh, <laughs> they, they didn't really make, it's not really made in HDR. It has an HDR calibration menu where all it does is like, so it's normally set from zero to a hundred nits. And then you can be like, oh, make the peaks uh, 300 nits or 500 nits or whatever. But it also moves the black level up at the same time. So it's the same range of contrast. So just you went from going from down. zero to a hundred to 200 to 300. <laughs> well, not really because there's <laughs> yeah. uh, on it's a, a logarithmic, logarithmic curve, yeah. but uh, yeah. So yeah, we, we had a good talk over there about uh, Dolby Vision and HDR and IMAX enhanced and all that. This is stuff we've covered on uh, AV Rand as well. But uh, if you'd like more of me talking about that stuff, uh, head on over to the digital media zone.com and check out entertainment 2.0. I was there. All right. LG Display confirmed they will begin mass producing 4K, I'm sorry, 8K yes. resolution OLED TVs in May of 2019. Yep. May, so like a couple of months. <laughs> it's <laughs> like, like half, seven half a year months. away, yeah. Six months away, we're going to get 8Ks and, for uh, all the people who don't need them, including all the people who still haven't bought a 4K TV. Yes, but, pre- preparing okay. for the 2020 broadcasts, right? They're looking at that whole super high vision 8K broadcast in 2020. So by the end of 2019, you'll be able to get an 8K OLED. Just think how, just think how crispy those will look as they come through your cable pipe you know i go to my parents and i can't even watch like uh, they're like watching football and i'm like you guys really think grass looks that way is that the way you think we're grass still doing looks the 720p all the thing, right yeah. <laughs> going from 720p to 8k yeah. see how it, see how it shifts back and forth in big <laughs> blocky motions is that how the grass looks to you in real life, because that's not how it's supposed to look. Anyways. So anyways, Netflix wants to make movies, which they have been making movies, but now they really want to make them. And they yes. want those movies to be eligible for awards, so they're trying out a new release strategy, debuting their movies exclusively in a small number of theaters and only making those movies available on their streaming service uh, some uh, one to three weeks later. It's way better than, you know, six months that yeah. it used to be. That, that is a short release window, but nevertheless, even though it's financed by netflix it's not on their streaming for service first it's in yeah. a handful of theaters for a one to three weeks and then it shows up on netflix so this short theatrical uh theatrical exclusivity window isn't long enough to get major uh, theater chains on board so theater owners are calling this a halfway gesture and criticizing netflix saying the strategy won't satisfy theatrical audiences filmmakers or netflix subscribers but Netflix says that this is the way to attract world-class filmmakers by giving them eligibility for awards while still sharing their work with the largest possible streaming audience. I think that they should just say, we will you, we will put it in the theaters for as long as you want. And once it stops mm-hmm. showing in theaters, three weeks later, it's going to be on Netflix. So if it's a huge hit, yeah, you know, it sticks around for four months, I then... Mean- Netflix has a bunch of movies that they don't finance themselves from other service providers. Those were in theaters for however long, and then they showed up on Netflix. Now, we don't always know which movies for sure are going to show up on Netflix. A lot do, but a lot also don't. So I have no problem with like, 
yeah, as a Netflix subscriber, I would have no problem with them saying, here's a movie we're making. It's going to be in theaters. It's going to be a reg- regular theatrical run. And when that theatrical run is over, it's going to be on Netflix. I'm like, cool. Like, as a subscriber, I'm not angry about that no, at all. No, no, no. I don't get I don't get Whoever's saying that, oh, that's not going to make Netflix subscribers happy. Yeah, it is. Yeah. <laughs> it doesn't do anything for me. I if, mean, I was gonna, if I was going to go to the movie to see the movie, I'd go to the movie to see the movie. Yeah. I mean, of course, there's going to be some troll who's like, I'm paying for this movie with my subscription, and it should show up on my subscription at the same time that it's in the theater. Like, yeah, it's I a know. Russian troll, technically. There's, there's going to be some troll. dummies who are going to say that, but I'm like, honestly, I really don't think the mo- most of the... I certainly wouldn't care, but who knows? Maybe I'm more rational. <laughs> there's definitely some people out there who are irrational. But oh, yes. The, they, yes. They just like to be angry about stuff, so ignore them. Exactly. Some comments here. Jonathan, since we uh, talked about minimum phase last week without me, so I don't know what you talked about, regarding deep base and equalizing one subwoofer for one seat, Jonathan points out that Room EQ Wizard has a fairly comprehensive section in their help documents that is all about minimum phase, if anyone is looking for a more detailed explanation. Yay. That is right. I do not fully comprehend it. I just know one of the characteristics where <laughs> if you flatten out the frequency response, you have automatically evened out the time domain and vice versa. So either solution works, right? You can pack your room with so much absorption that it flattens out the time domain, which automatically gives you flat frequency response, or you can EQ the frequency response, which automatically gives you good time domain response. That's how it works in the super deep bass. I don't exactly know why, but it kind of goes into all the details over there. Yes. Math is well, why. Well, <laughs> even over there, they're like, yeah, the math is really complicated, so we're not going to bother printing that here, but here's the word explanation. Yeah. So, yes, e- even they don't go full hog. <laughs> All right. Nathan just wanted to rant a bit about Amazon Prime Video. Is it about lip sync? He wanted to try <laughs> the best experience possible uh, from the service, 4K HDR video and Atmos audio. So he bought an Amazon Fire Stick 4K Fire TV Stick 4K, which supports all the audio and video formats available from Amazon Prime Video, and settled in to watch Jack Ryan since that's their only Atmos title at the moment. Mm-hmm. Dude, that show sucks. <laughs> I I don't understand why some it's people getting... like it quite a bit. So. I don't understand, man. That guy looks so goofy, and then and I like him. Okay, it's not yeah. it, but he's just not Jack Ryan. And mm-hmm. then the first couple of shows are like I watched Think Two. And I was like, nah, I'm good. So maybe I'll give it another one, but I just really didn't like it. Okay, anyways. Uh, but just finding Jack Ryan in its 4K HDR format was a challenge. Searching the f- uh, for the title directly only brings up the HD version. And once he finally found... Really? Once yeah, he finally weird. found the 4K version, it doesn't play in Atmos automatically. Atmos is available, but you have to pause the show after starting its stream and then manually turn on the Atmos and the audio options. Even worse... It never remembers the settings, so you have to manually activate Atmos every time you want to watch it. Uh, not exactly user friendly. Now, one thing, okay, that that's all very dumb. Yes, okay, we can all agree on that. And and obviously, like that's not the hardware's fault. That no. is, that is all on Amazon's streaming service software side, so it's up to them to fix it on their service side. Right. right? No. But the thing I do like about that is when you pause a scene in Amazon Prime, mm-hmm. the people who are on the screen or in the scene their little bios will pop up oh really yeah I didn't it is that. so awesome man you're like you'll pause it and you're like oh that that's the that's this is the actor who plays the mr robot guy this is yeah. the actor who's playing the so-and-so or the actress who's playing this it's that is so cool i love that about amazon everything else about amazon sucks <laughs> but that is awesome. i've you know been really a huge sucks? fan of prime like especially in canada where the selection is really small so yeah, yeah. <laughs> Well, I, I feel like it's really small here, too, but that's mostly because their <laughs> interface makes it almost impossible right. to find anything. Yeah. <laughs> you know? It's like okay, it's like they give you all these little sliders of things, and no matter what slider you're on, it's like, yep, Jack Ryan's on there. I'm like, <laughs> romantic apparently comedies? Apparently, not going to show you the 4K version. So. No, apparently not. And why... Why are there multiple like why are there multiple areas to find the ver- I mean I noticed on Amazon Prime Video you can find a season of a show even though they have more than that season That drives me absolutely like, bonkers Why don't you just have one entry for the show It's like oh here's <laughs> here's here's Hannibal season 3 I yeah. like, I haven't seen the first two Hannibals I guess yeah. I better I better, I, better, I guess I better not watch it and I realize oh wait they have them They have them they just <laughs> they're just they have a different thumbnail and they're in a different God, place. That's weird. It's, it, I mean, who, that, who's who, UI who design? Who thought that? Yeah, camp, like, <laughs> 
yeah, that's the way we want to do this. And even like, I, he's right. Searching for stuff doesn't always bring up the results you would expect. So not only that, I mean, searching God. for stuff on Amazon is so aggravating. My wife's like, oh, I want to, she was like, she, this is my wife says to me, I want to see Seven Samurais. Mm -hmm. I'm like, Kurosawa? You want to see Kurosawa film? She's like, yeah. I, I was reading a, a listicle and it had, this is the number one movie in the last hundred years. I'm like, hmm. I don't know if I agree with that, but no. I would definitely watch this movie with you. It's an amazing movie. Uh, I've seen it before. And so she's like, well, let's go let's go stream it. I'm like, yeah, we're not going to find it, but we'll try. <laughs> so I searched on them. Of course, on Amazon Prime, it's like, yep, here it is. Mm -hmm. You can buy it. It's I the, don't want to yeah, buy it. The buy <laughs> or the it? rental version, yeah. I, I, don't want, I don't want you to give me those results. I want you to give me just the stream results. I'm not here to buy stuff. So if I, you need, that's the thing you need to put into a different window. All right. Let's get into the questions here. Ted, take out a new shelf for his gear. I read this question before this podcast. Well, I was mm -hmm. waiting for my computer to restart. <laughs> and I'm like, Ted. Uh, so he decided to rerun Odyssey. So he's got a new shelf for his gear, and he rerun Odyssey because of it. I don't know if that was totally necessary, but he did. Uh, but this time, he used the Odyssey Editor app that gave him the option to stop the equalization at a given frequency and based on some trial and error and everything he's read about the uh, a room's transition frequency he settled on only having the eq applied up to 300 hertz he likes the results he he measured uh, with room eq wizard and even though everything above 300 hertz now looks a little more jagged than when odyssey was eqing the entire frequency range it just seems to sound more natural more life like for him so ted just wants our thoughts on this i can already tell you what our thoughts are <laughs> you answered the question when you said that it seems more natural and lifelike to you and you like the results you like the results once you <laughs> once you said those words you answered this question but we i will continue plenty of articles recommend this approach of only equaling up to a room frequency uh room's transition frequency and avoiding equalization of the higher frequencies a lot of people say a lot of things about a lot of stuff that's all very <laughs> dumb but whatever some of the research he's read theorizes that it's all due to uh it's all to do with direct sound versus reflective sound that our brain is already a much better filter than any room correction program but below the room's transition frequency where it's all reflected sound that's where eq can be a real benefit what's our take our take is that you like it so don't who cares? <laughs> yes but he, i'm sure he wants to know a little bit more about the reasons why well or... i understand I, but he's you know it, it, a lot of times these eq things that we're talking about people we're, we're trying to they bought the EQ so that they can make their room sound better. And then we're like, okay, now that you've done it, you know what would really help? Some room treatments. But Ted's already there. Oh, yeah. Right? Ted's already got all so. that stuff. So, yeah, Ted's a perfect candidate for, you know, EQ doing as little as it needs to do because he's done everything else to prepare his room and his experience beforehand. You know, so, I mean, think about how much time this man has spent with placing his speakers. I mean, it's been, what, a year, <laughs> two mm -hmm. of getting the speakers in the right place, moving the entire room. Did he ever move the room? Uh, I haven't heard that he has. Yeah, but he talked about it. So, I mean, that was something That's that he had considered. Yeah. So, you know... Above 300 hertz, you know, there's a lot of there's a lot of things out there that people have said about you know oh well you know this hard and fast rule you know you shouldn't EQ anything up here or you shouldn't do that shouldn't do anything within this range or whatever and the reality is it's true until it's not and <laughs> the, and and in your case Ted it worked great but I you will not find us saying don't ever EQ anything above 300 hertz because most of the time you should absolutely EQ things above 300 hertz because there's all kinds of stuff going on in people's rooms that aren't your room. I mean, for, for from my perspective, it comes back to the similar thing of if your results in all of your seats are not the same, then right. trying to EQ that is going to mean, like if you have you know, a peak in one seat that is at that sure. very same frequency, a dip in another seat, you you can't EQ that properly. And it doesn't matter what frequency we're talking about, you can't EQ that properly. Now, nobody is going to disagree about the EQing of, well, somebody out there is going to disagree about the EQing <laughs> of the bass, but nobody <laughs> with, with knowledge that we would listen to is going to argue about the EQing of the bass. Like we talked about the whole minimum phase situation last week, which is, you know, as you EQ the bass and get flat frequency response, it automatically fixes the time domain for you and vice versa. 
versa. If you fix the time domain, it'll flatten your frequency response. Uh, we understand quite well the evening of the frequency response across multiple seats using multiple subs. And then, of course, once you have uniform response, then you can EQ that very nicely to either be flat or equal the target curve that you're going for. The issue when you start trying to equalize higher and higher frequencies is the higher you go in frequency, the more directional that sound becomes. Right. The less it is omnidirectional or that our ears can't triangulate the source of the sound because as the sound waves get much, much shorter, we can triangulate where it originated from. We get these reflections that are not equal to the original sound because they were scattered by the surface that they hit or other things that long bass frequencies don't do. And as you move from seat to seat, you very well might have significantly different frequency response from the dispersion of the speaker being different, from the distance between your ears and the angle to the speakers being different from what seat you're in and triangulating the response from the reflections being different because they scattered off of different surfaces differently. And then you try to equalize that and you might be able to do that well for one position, but right. not for multiple positions. And we know that Ted cares about multiple positions in his theater. So the whole not equalizing higher frequencies that are more directional that you can triangulate and all these things, to me that makes sense because it's so difficult to get that uniform across all of the seats. And therefore, if you just kind of leave it alone, our brain is very good at going, yeah, that's the direct sound versus the reflected sound. Floyd Toole's done a ton of research into this where he's like, yeah, we expect to hear those reflections. And when we don't, it sounds odd to our brain. So that whole, this sounds a bit more like real life, even though it might not be as flat objectively, it sounds more like real life. Well, real life isn't flat all the time. So yeah, that, that makes a lot of sense. So I'm largely in agreement with this approach, especially when you're dealing with um, odd shaped surfaces in your room and multiple seats that you care about. I think it would be very difficult to equalize that to get uniform response for all your seats. Right. In a perfect world, the the EQ program, whatever it was, would leave all the frequencies alone that it can't right. affect for all the seats. The reality is sometimes they don't do that. Yeah. They'll, they'll you know, so yes, it would. It, it should flatten things out slightly above 300 hertz. It should. And it should leave the things alone that it cannot fix. But sometimes it's going to try anyways. And therein oh, yeah. lies the, the problem. So, I mean, it's fine. Yes, great. Yep. It, no, it, I'm, it I'm largely in agreement with it. That's, yeah, that's it, my it, take. It, yeah. So how do you calibrate the room's frequent? Uh, how do you calculate calibrate? Man, my eyes. The room's transition frequency anyway. Ted asks. Well, how did he know to do it above three hundred hertz if he didn't? Well, that's that's sort of the advice that's out there. Some say oh. you know don't do anything above five hundred hertz. Some say don't do anything above two hundred and fifty hertz. And then some say don't do anything above the room's transition frequency. So he's like, how do you calculate the room's transition frequency? All right, so how do you do it? It's pretty simple. You figure out what is the shortest dimension in your room. That's often the height of the room. Don't forget that dimension. So it's often like eight or nine feet is the height of your room. Uh, you figure out what wavelength equals that height, and that is the transition frequency of the room, <laughs> whatever the shortest dimension is. So like eight feet equals approximately a 140 hertz frequency that is the wavelength of 140 hertz is about eight feet so the whole like don't do anything above the room's transition frequency often we say about double the room's transition frequency I was which say, gets i would have a real hard time hertz. suggesting somebody not eq above 140 <laughs> Yep. That seems Although, awfully I mean, low. You, you could. That's, you could. That's doable. You could not EQ at all. People do it all the time. But Yeah, the, the room's transition frequency is the when the shortest dimension is equal to the wavelength of the sound. That is the definition of what the transition frequency is. All right, Damien. This is on Facebook, I guess, and Twitter? Yes, he sent questions from multiple places, none of which were email, so, you know. <laughs> All right. Damien is asking on behalf of a friend. His friend's theater is uh, theater room is a dedicated sealed room, roughly 19 by 21 by 9. He has two rows of seats, and he's wondering what he should do in the way of surround speakers. His friend heard a home theater set up with just one row of seats, and he didn't like how, to distract, how distracting one of the monopole... Monopole surround speakers was every time it made a sound but he was sitting in one of the seats that was closer to one side so that particular surround speaker was very close to him and pretty much aimed directly at his head mm -hmm. his friend talked about some uh, talked to someone at a home theater shop and they suggested he use bipolar surround speakers for a more diffuse sound but then the friend heard damien set up and, and he liked that 
does Damien have monopoles? I guess he's I, got monopoles. As far as I know, he does, yeah. Okay. But he wasn't sure how well it would work for, for two rows of seats. Damien mentioned using multiple surround speakers, at least two on each side, uh, one for each row, uh, or maybe using an array of surround speakers, just like a full-size cinema. What do we think would give the best results? Uh, okay, so... This is a perfect example of somebody who had one 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 experience, and then mm-hmm. it is extrapolate that to mean that that's how they feel about everything in the whole world. <laughs> so, <laughs> now I can completely understand this. I have sat too close to a surround speaker mm-hmm. before, and it is very distracting. So have I. Yep. Now, yeah, a hundred percent understand where this mm-hmm. guy's coming from, uh, and that is you know why we say that there's a you know you eq for one seat or that you worry about a you know a certain seat or a certain group of seats and then you try to make sure everything sounds the best for that seat and some people are like well i want another row of seats Mm -hmm. or i want my couch to be wider or i want this or i want that you're like well that person's gonna be sitting right next to the surround speaker and you're like "Ah, i don't really care about that person you were that dude (laughs) yeah (laughs) okay you were in you were the guy (laughs) you were the guy in the bad seat and said oh this is terrible i hate being this close to this thing Right. Well, don't in your theater, don't sit that close to that thing and then you'll be fine. Uh, there's nothing wrong with having bipolar speakers. I mean, I have no. bipolar speakers in my surround, my setup right now. The reality, though, is that these days, all the recommendations, all the content is being mixed with the idea of direct firing speakers in mind, monopole speakers in mind. Uh, that's just the way things are being mixed. But you're kind of your Damien, in this case, the friend is suggesting the best of both worlds which is essentially two monopole speakers Mm -hmm. one behind each row of seats Mm -hmm. you know just slightly behind each row of seats which is essentially you could make the argument a bipole speaker (laughs) you know they are firing far apart but yeah yeah Yeah, they're they're, they're, it is if you took one bipole speaker and slice it in half and split out between two rows that's what you did so you are creating essentially a bipole speaker to give you a a nice diffuse sound on that sound that side but is uh, it has a more direct uh, effect for the people who are in each row, but it also gives a little bit extra on that those sides. So, I mean, if it were me, and you have the money, and he has the money, I would get two. In, you know, I would have two speakers on each side, yep. not an array, but two speakers on each side. Yeah, I'm I'm in agreement with that. I mean, what what makes it distracting is when it's basically firing right at you. Dude, a bipolar speaker would not have helped that situation. It wouldn't help because, yeah, so like he's thinking uh, when he went to talk to the person at the home theater shop, he's yeah. he was thinking, is there one speaker I could buy that would work for two rows of seats? Right. And they're like, right. well, you could get a bipolar, but I'm like, but now, so it let's doesn't say, really work for two rows. Of seats. Yeah, I, like, I hate when they say that. Let's say you put that bipolar halfway between the two rows. So it's in front of the back row and behind the front row. And because it's got these angled sides, it's basically firing straight at both of them. But now the people in the back row get the experience of the surround sound coming from in front of them. Yes, over to the sides, but from in front of them. And the people in the back now experience it coming from a little bit too far behind them, not from their side, right? And if you go with a dipole speaker, it can be even worse. Like that was really meant for one row of seats because it's supposed to be directly to the side of that row of seats. And now that row is in the null of the dipole. So they hear nothing direct. They only hear reflected sound. But again, it doesn't work for the back row of seats because the rear facing drivers are essentially aiming straight at that back row and they get the experience of, oh, the sound's coming from in front of me yet again. So... Yeah, I'm, I'm in complete agreement with Tom. I would go with monopole speakers. I would basically think of each row as its own row. Where do you want the surround speaker for that row? Do that times two. Right? Yeah. If you're the person who wants them directly to the sides, which, hey, if you're in the leftmost seat and the left surround speaker is 90 degrees to your left, like, that's going to be distracting. So I usually want to put it a little bit behind me and a little bit above me. I still agree with the original I know. like recommendation of placement of having it like a couple of feet above your head because that is also less distracting. And also just like a full-size movie theater where all the surround speakers are still elevated. They're very high. Because if they don't want the them. people on the side having a speaker like right in their ear. So I'm still in favor of elevating them a bit, having them a little bit behind you, not egregiously, but a foot or two behind you and a foot or two above you and then just do that times two right and yeah. from personal experience like every once in a while we'll have people over and they'll all sit on the main couch and then i will sit 
in uh, the back row. Mm -hmm. uh, just to let people, you know, have the good experience. Sure. And I'll sit in the back row, which means I've got the surround back speakers l <laughs> literally over my head, yep. probably in front of me slightly. The front of their baffles <laughs> is in front of my face slightly. And the sur the side speakers are way, way in front of me. Mm -hmm. And it is, it's not a good experience. It's suboptimal. <laughs> suboptimal is not saying it right. Like I have a friend too. He's got, he's, I, I help him set up his speak his, his setup. And he's like, this is the only place I can put my surround speakers. I'm okay. like, okay, well, let's put your chairs here. He goes, no, I can't put the chairs. There. <laughs> I'm like, what do you mean you can't put the chairs? Oh, no, you got to put the chairs here. I'm like, your mm. chairs are behind your surround speakers. Mm -hmm. He's like, well, this is where I can put them. I'm like, mm -hmm. okay. It, 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 you, I have never experienced surround sound in his house. <laughs> right you right. don't experience it it just all sounds like it's coming from the front sure so uh i would 100 percent recommend putting more surround speakers all right he asks what's the flat wire uh speaker wire we sometimes recommend again uh there's actually a brand called flat wire isn't there but i don't think that's the one we recommend because they're no. real expensive yeah that's right i recommend uh sewell's ghost wire i like sewell and i like their ghost wire and that's the one i all recommend right. all right all right <laughs> we are going to have to take a Eco B break. Eco B break. Because <laughs> it, it, I am I am glistening. I can feel ah. it. It is so hot in here. Um, yes, it's so, so much more convenient with the home automation, uh, app controllable, network attached thermostat versus just setting the thing before you come in the room. You know, so much it's, better now. It's better. <laughs> it is better. No, I mean. I, I knew uh, the, the difference is, is that I would I would still not have said it before I came mm, in the room. Okay. And, and now then you I can would just be just now I would just be hot without physically getting up and leaving. <laughs> yeah. All right. Okay. The, okay. Okay, I was just talking to my wife about this last night. You know, people are like, "Oh my god, you must love Florida so much. It's so it, you know, the temp the, the weather's so wonderful and sunny mm -hmm. all the time, blah blah blah." I'm like, "Listen. The forecast for today is a high of 89 and a low of 79. That is a 10 degree difference yep. all day long. You cannot turn your AC off or your house will turn to mold. Like just immediately." <laughs> To mold. I, I would definitely not. I like. I live in Vancouver. I'm in Canada. It's very temperate in Vancouver, but it's too hot for me. So yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, we're still on the same dude, Damien. What would we suggest for a thousand dollar or less five point one audio setup? Assuming this is more casual family room or living room type setup, open concept, not a dedicated theater, but a normal eight to ten foot viewing distance and just normal furnishings, carpet, drapes, sofa, but no specialized room treatments. Great. Assume it's for games, TV, streaming, uh, or just something to enhance a nice flat panel. Better than the sound bar, but not looking to put up a cinema, uh, putting a cinema to shame or anything. What we, we recommend? Thousand bucks. Thousand dollars is real hard to swing, dude. I would recommend two speakers and a subwoofer. <laughs> that, I mean, that's not you. a bad suggestion at all because I, you I, can get higher quality bookshelf speakers, just a pair of them versus five yeah, speakers I, total. Sure. That really, that's that's a, I'd spend. Five hundred bucks on the sub and five hundred dollars on two, two, two bookshelf speakers. What's, what's going to power them? Oh, we got to do that too. <laughs> yeah, it's a five point one setup, not just speakers oh in the sub. Oh my god! Yes. Oh, well, then I guess you have to spend two hundred, three hundred fifty dollars <laughs> on it. Get a cheap receiver. Do you have any specifics that you want to have? No, man. Or? I just read no? this question for the first time just now. No. <laughs> All right. Well, I'm I'm spending four hundred of your dollars on an RSL Speedwoofer Ten S. Uh, it, for an open concept room, it's definitely not going to pressurize, and it won't quite dig down to 20 hertz. But uh, hey, for 400 bucks, you really can't do better. So Speedwoofer 10S from RSL. Uh, I'm going to take $200 and spend that on a Yamaha RXV383 5.1 AV receiver. It passes through Dolby Vision and all that, so you said you already got a nice flat panel in this scenario. So at least it handles all the video stuff nicely, and it's 5.1, and it gives you very basic YPOW auto setup. It gives you something, and then that leaves you 400 bucks, which, amazingly, for $400, you can get the Pioneer Andrew Jones five-speaker package that's the center and the bookshelves, and actually you can get the one with the towers. <laughs> For 400 bucks oh, uh, there's, there's a seller on amazon who's, who's who's selling the whole package there 400 bucks for five pioneer andrew jones speakers so i wouldn't be disappointed with that setup at all and uh, yeah, that sounds bucks. all right yeah yeah that sounds decent I can live with that josh josh just moved into a new loft style apartment it's pretty much a blank slate so he wants our help in setting up uh, a living room from scratch the whole space is roughly 19 feet long 38 feet wide and 16 feet high it's one big rectangle dude mm -hmm. his living room area is on the right side roughly 19 feet long 14 feet wide and 16 feet high 16 feet high is it's gonna throughout the whole thing pretty much yes 
Uh, for those of you that cannot see the pictures, imagine a humongous shoebox because that's what this thing is. And he's got stairs on either side going up to like. I a mean, loft. it almost looks like it was converted from something, doesn't it? From like a warehouse, yeah. Yeah, because it's, it's exactly got these big things that are now bricked and concreted up, but they look like where semi trucks used to come in to make deliveries. Absolutely, and then yeah. uh, like on one, like the on one wall, there's an opening which is clearly the kitchen area, but mm-hmm. the. The, the rest of it, it just looks like it was a big, uh, you know, rectangular space that they turned into a loft. It's very cool looking. I, I, I like it quite a bit. Uh, the chairs just sitting alone waiting for a table or a sad, sad face. But, yeah, it's good. <laughs> so anyways, all right. So it, it which, which side is the TV? There is a TV on a side right now, or is that a computer? There's a computer on one side, so I imagine the TV is going to be on the other side. Is that what I'm taking from this? Yeah, he's actually marked out uh, with some green tape. It's it's to like the, the right of the kitchen island, if you're looking at the big overall shot. Very, on one of those big concreted up bays, there's a, like a green line you can sort of see. Oh, okay. And that's like he's taped off where he wants to put his projection screen. And yeah, over on the left side, below the bedroom loft area there's like a, a computer set up right now okay. but uh, no he's going for a big setup over to the right there where he's taped off with so the- he'll have a wall on his right and nothing on his left for a million feet correct okay with such a completely open space and no way to have light control he's got it in mind to install 120 inch elite screens aeon eon aeon clr which is ceiling light reflecting uh, rejecting i'm sorry uh projection screen it's in a Dell S seven one eight QL ultra short throw projector. What do we think about this proposed setup? Why does he need a short throw projector? He can just ultra set it... short throw projector. Why does he need that? Why because can't he, just... he can't control the light in here, and he's thinking he can use an ultra short throw projector that literally sits sits like a foot and a half in front of the screen. Get this ceiling light rejecting screen, which is like specifically mentioned, is meant for ultra short throw projectors. And he's okay. hoping that even with a pretty high ambient light situation, he can get the 120-inch screen size and still use it during the day. That's what he's hoping for. Now, this Dell, uh, the S718QL, um, it's actually like a laser light engine. It's the, the dual blue lasers with the yellow phosphor. Hmm. So it's a DLP laser light engine, like uh, 5,000 lumens, ultra short throw, about $5,000. Uh, that's sort of the price range that he's in here. And yeah, I mean, this is all about trying to get a really big screen that can work in a pretty high ambient light situation. I'm kind of surprised that the the ultra short throw go below it. Yeah, it would sit on a little table. Okay. It would just sit on a little table directly below the screen. Like I say, the front of that ultra short throw is literally like 18 inches in front of the screen because it, it no, actually I, kind of fires. Whenever I think, think of ultra short throws, I always think of the the ones that go on top and shoot down. So when he was talking ah. about a screen that rejects light from the top, I'm like, how's that going to no, work? No, this one okay. was on a, on a little a little table direct. Like he could put his equipment stand, your normal equipment stand right, right. for all your other gear, and then the the projector could just sit on top of that. It kind of look like a center speaker, but they're sitting and fire I mean, onto for, the screen. I mean, and how much does that screen cost? Uh, about nineteen hundred dollars. So we're looking at inch. six, almost seven thousand. Almost seven thousand dollars. Yeah. But seven thousand dollars, dude, you can get a real big flat panel that indicates. But you're still all talking like eighty five inches. Sit closer. <laughs> I, mean, I hate to say it. it's not I like know. acoustics are going to be. Uh, yeah, the acoustics in this place are going to be awful. Yes, there Which is we're no going to be digging into in a little bit, but yeah. So, the... you know, spending seven thousand dollars to get a hundred and twenty inch screen, so you yeah. can sit an extra foot and a half away. <laughs> well, a little bit more than that, but yeah. Uh, come on, you I know, mean, nine feet versus about eleven or twelve feet. So yeah, I'm sorry, two, two, to two three or three feet, feet farther away. Two, that's 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 a lot of money for a couple of feet. You know, to for me, but it is. You know, I mean, I mean, honestly, the the alternative would be an eighty five inch flat panel for sure in this same yeah. or less price range. Like I would point you to uh, Sony's X nine hundred F in their eighty five inch size, which is like you can find for around fifty five hundred dollars now, which is pretty darn good for an eighty five inch, really darn good LCD flat panel like OLEDs. The problem, the problem I have with this whole anybody who comes to us with this, these questions about how can I make this work in this where there's light and always mm-hmm. light and blah, and blah 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 i'm like it's not always light you are going right. to watch it at night sometimes sure. you know and you're going to be stuck with the screen 128 screen which is going to be 
you know, light rejecting this and that and sparkle that and, and hot I, spotting and everything else. I'm just... I ugh. do have to warn the way that the Aeon screen is designed. It, it is really designed to reject light from above, but not so much from the sides. You mean that big white wall that'll be a so, couple of feet away from it? And the windows <laughs> that are over on the left and, unfortunately, windows that appear to be in the kitchen area. So there's light coming from the same direction yeah. that the projector light is coming from like yeah this is a real bad challenge for a projector now i mean look like high sense has their ten thousand um, dollar like similar thing ultra short throw setup that they're like oh no this is a this is a 100 or a 120 inch tv because it'll still work and like people have seen it at trade shows and it's not that bad but the black is definitely like no everyone is like yeah the black can't be black it's impossible for the black to be black it's a crazy bright like you know like this one 5,000 or 8,000 right. lumen projector in the case of Hisense it's crazy bright projector it's the ambient light rejecting screen but it still can't make black actually look black when the lights are on well it's, it's got that stairway on the other side right mm -hmm. if you just flip this 180 degrees and you put whatever you know, screen or under the stairs, under the stairs, and then mm. you sort of take and drape something underneath the stairs. <laughs> you know what I mean? Because the like, stairs so right now you can see through. a little shadow box. Exactly. Ah. You could put it underneath. That. I don't know what the dimensions are underneath there. How big? I don't think yeah. you can get. You definitely can't get the screen he has marked out on this wall. But you no, could that, get the angle of the stairs coming. It down, would certainly but... help with the whole trying to get mm. uh, some light control. Yeah, you know, making some yourself kind of a light. shadow box situation. Yeah, yeah, I could see that. And then you could go with like a Luna Vision's ambient light rejecting screen, which rejects light from every direction. Right. Uh, except for like straight on, which is where, of course, you would end up and putting the projector. Then you wouldn't have any windows directly facing it, I don't think. Yes, all the windows, yeah, right, all right. the windows would be blocked from all directions. Or you could just get an 85-inch flat panel. I would definitely get the 85-inch flat panel. <laughs> I gotta be honest with I you, know. But... <laughs> I mean, as much as I mean, look, I I completely get the I want 120 inch screen, but I I do have to agree. Like in this setup, the 85-inch flat panel. First of all, it costs less. And it will definitely look better. The black will actually look black. And yeah, you just you sit close to it. You sit next to your fireplace instead of behind your fireplace, right? Right. I do. So I have to that, agree. Uh, is that I, a fireplace? I believe so. I'm pretty sure that black I, I, thing on the thing. It just looks, looks like a black thing from where I'm saying. I just, yeah, it looks it like, like a fireplace. That, yeah, I'm pretty that sure. Way. Oh, whatever. Man, right, I know uh, that's not the answer he wanted to hear. But and oh, it's I, I know it's not either. It, like I it's mean, not that I'm not like I think that Dell Ultra Short Throw. I haven't seen it in person, but going by the specs and, and knowing what other Ultra Short Throws look like, I'm like it can be impressive. I'm not sure. saying that it can be impressive if you have to have the size. Like I don't, I don't think you've made bad choices in the products you were considering. Not one iota. Those are the appropriate products if this is what you were gonna do. But yeah, I think the 85 inch flat panel will look better and cost less. On the audio side, he's thinking of starting with just an LCR setup and adding, uh, so left, center, right, mm -hmm. for those of you that aren't familiar, and adding subwoofers and surrounds later. His front runners are a Denon uh, AVR X4400H receiver with Klipsch, reference three, tower, and center speaker. Yeah, reference think... three, that's like their flagship. Well, you know, yeah. Why a God's green earth would you want horn leather speakers in this highly reflective <laughs> space is beyond me. Well, he's thinking it's a big space. He needs a lot of sound. That's what. Yeah, but you're not. Are, how, are you sitting on the other side of the space? Because if you're he, not. He was also for in his email, he's mentioned he's like, well, since I'm only getting left center right to begin with, he's thinking like big towers so that maybe he can not need subwoofers. And I'm yeah, like, well, that's never going to happen. Uh, so uh, you're never well. First of all, pressurizing the space is a non-issue anyway. So we're we're not going to want to because you will you literally are pressurizing your entire house. There's like right. two doors in the entire. House. Yeah, we're gonna go for like a uh, near field subwoofer right. placement, probably like either side of your seating. Yeah, would be very appropriate, and you're not gonna fully pressurize it. But if you need more super deep tactile, maybe you look at you know butt kickers or something like that. But I'm gonna go near field, either side of your couch, couple of right. subs. Yeah, and I, I I think you need bookshelf speakers. I don't think you need anything that's super hmm. horn load or super efficient. I mean, you I'm know, not opposed should... to having towers just because the form factor might work more easily. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, you've got certainly got the the space to place them in. Yes. Though if you place them based on where you have that screen right now you're going to be, be basically putting one in a corner so that would be mm. not that would not be optimal mm. but uh 
yeah, I, I, I would go with smaller speakers on stands and uh, not worry about trying to fill up the entire space with. Uh, I mean, I mean the, the other thought I had was maybe he is thinking like, oh, I'll be up in my bedroom loft and I want to be able to play the speakers down there and still hear them clearly. Which, dude, that means some. That means some output, all right. That that does, but I don't. I don't. I mean, I think that. Not Depending recommended. What, <laughs> have another set of speakers up in your bedroom if that's what you want to do. You might as well. Yeah. You know, I mean, I have, I've been known to crank my speakers at, you know, open the, not, I haven't done it since I've been here, but when I, when I was living in apartments, stuff like that, I would crank my speakers and then clean. That's mm -hmm. one of the things I like to do. Uh, so I can understand that. But in this day and age with fantastic headphones and Bluetooth speakers everywhere and, you know, she who shall not be named controlling the whole thing, mm -hmm. I just have a hard time you know it, it, even if you're gonna have a party yep you have know, multiple speakers around the house so yeah. it's much more yeah instead of like whoever is over on the right side of your house is can't deaf hear now. anything yeah. yeah 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 spread it out a bit more yeah i have to agree with that it's similar to like how you're treating lighting right have have zones of audio throughout rather than just one and thing trying to light the whole we could thing. give you a hundred different recommendations for speakers uh and i mean sure. all the ones that we recommend that are free for two-way shipping you should definitely try out but what you, you really should do is you should go to your i mean this guy's willing to spend some cash mm -hmm. basically from what we're seeing so go to your dealers go to magnolia go to wherever has got speakers and then figure out first of all where you're planning on sitting in relation to your tv mm -hmm. figure out how far away your speakers are and then sit there and when you're doing your auditions in these different places, and because honestly, I mean, depending on how much what we're going to be doing uh, for uh, room treatments, which no matter what we do is not there's there's just so much you know square footage of yeah. area it's for all reflection, hard and flat, all of it. Yeah, that uh, you know, I would not worry as much about home auditions. <laughs> I would just whatever they got, whatever room they got you in, <laughs> it's probably going to be as good if not better than yours so let's just go with that yeah i mean so i mean the the clips reference threes it's not that i don't think those aren't very nice speakers no no they're it's fantastic just, all the money you would have spent on those i'm like take a huge portion of that money back and we're gonna spend it on attempting to treat this entire space instead i want you to spend like more money on room treatments than on speakers at this point because that's yeah. kind of what you need to do i mean i bet if you just go in here and just go hello that it like literally echoes in this oh place. it absolutely echoes in this yeah. place yeah your footsteps in there ting, ting, yeah and I, whole, the whole place rings i'm sure we've got to treat the heck out of this place so all the money you would have put in those speakers and go into treatments instead right so Justin wants to hear our thoughts on the space as a whole regarding the audio and what you should do to get the most out of it now and in the future. Put something on your walls, like tapestries. <laughs> I mean, you know, yeah. thick, thick room treatments that are the size of tapestry. I mean, tapestries. If, if you like the kind of sparse look, which honestly, I like the look. You know, I, I think too. it's cool. I think it's it very was, clean think, and that. Yeah. And I'm sure that was part of the attraction. Well, yeah. you can get panels that, I mean, if you talk to Gick, um, you can get panels that... 100% match the color of your existing walls. They can do that for you. Right. So you can have the same look just with, I mean, in this amount of space, I'd be very keen on DIY because it's like put as much absorption right. over as much hard flat surface as you can in here and then just cover it with fabric that looks nice. That's what I, you know, and I'm, I'm like I said, tapestries. I wasn't joking. I'm thinking right. about like these the wall. The, the ceiling is what sixteen feet tall. Sixteen I'm feet high. Like, oh, the it, the ceiling. If you can put like uh, baffle treatments up on the ceiling, that'd be great. Yeah, I'm thinking like those those long concrete bay looking things. You know, like in there, even if it's just like an inch thick, you know, yep. maybe an inch and a half thick, sitting right on the wall. You know, just just doing a little framing with some uh, one mm -hmm, by or mm -hmm. you know two, two by and uh stuffing all that up with 10 feet tall two feet wide all the way up to the top wrapping it in a fabric color that you like mm -hmm. or that you think uh, uh compliments or compliments blends your, in. your, your yeah. blends into your room because you've already got lines on your floor right yes so yes. these would be nice tall vertical lines mm -hmm, that you could be mm -hmm, having mm -hmm. going all the way like two in each bay you know, they wouldn't have to be right next to each other. They're not trying to fill the entire bay up, but just two in each bay just to like, you know, it, it gives it an interesting look while yeah. at the same time. I mean, you could actually make this place look amazingly cool, even enhance the way it already looks with 
treatments because we are not designers <laughs> we are not well, yeah, yeah yeah i wouldn't so yeah so but maybe not take what are. we're saying literally but like say what we said to somebody who knows what the heck they're talking right, right, about right. and say oh i can kind of see what you're saying maybe we could do this and then you know they can come up with something but yeah everything that goes on your wall should be full of insulation <laughs> yes <laughs> like, yeah and the, I, the ceiling too honestly if you could that'd be great yeah, yeah, yeah. ceiling ceiling is harder to do I, I, does he have a picture of the ceiling he does have a little bit of a picture a bit, it's yeah. a flat white it is from, flat from from one side to the other this is like a you big know and the, white the lights box. are hanging down so having stuff that is is somewhat on the ceiling wouldn't look tremendously out of place in here. I mean, you could even go for uh, Gick's really cool uh, panels where they have like wood patterns on the front. So it's like right, absorption. Right, diffusion and the absorption. Yeah, it's absorption inside and then wood uh, patterns on the front. Like you could have like really cool patterns and stuff in here that way so yeah like all the money you were going to spend we're going to save you like two thousand dollars on the display and then we're going to save you thousands of dollars on the speakers and put all of that into treating this place because that is by far your limiting factor and and the rec uh, let's go back to the receiver he wanted the 4400 or yeah whatever that it seems was. very unnecessary that seems totally unnecessary why not the 3400 yes. or whatever because you're never going pat you're never your atmos is out in yeah. this place you, i mean Okay, oh, it's not you out. Could. It's you could hang them. You could. you could hang the speakers from poles like your lights are right above you. You could, and if that's your plan, then more power to you, sir. But um, I, in this space, I'd be like five point one, seven point one. I'm done. Yeah, he only mentioned adding surrounds and subs to his left set or right, so I think yeah. he's going five point two, which is great. I'm absolutely fine with that in yeah. here. And Let's yeah, save him a couple more. A couple, couple hundred. hundred. That's only a couple hundred. We're not into the thousands with that choice. But yeah, X thirty four hundred H seems like it could definitely do what you want to do. Yeah. Michael. Michael has owned several LCD TVs over the years, Sony's, Vizio's, and now a TCL 55-inch S515 4K model. On all of them, he's always perceived a sickening green hue in the shadows and dark scenes. He hmm. always sets the TV to its warmest color temperature and adjusts the basic pictures control, contrast, brightness, color, tint using test patterns. But he always finds himself turning down the color until the green tinge no longer bothers him, which leaves him with an undersaturated image, although he'd rather live with that than the green tinge he sees. He has never seen this issue mentioned in any reviews, which he finds astonishing. Have we ever seen it ourselves or heard other people mention it? Could he, it maybe be addressed using the, a, the more advanced color management system controls? Any way to adjust these without hiring a professional calibrator since he's already going uh, for budget TVs the, and the cost of a professional calibrator would be prohibitive. Well, dude, if it bothers you this much, save up birthday money or something like straight up because that's the, to me the thing yeah. is though like what he's describing is it's not what everybody sees it's not what i see and therefore a professional calibrator might not even help you because might not might not but i mean it, although they for can work peace with of mind you. yeah, yeah for, and not only that you could you could definitely sit there and say it's still green to me Right. And they'll be right, like right, 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 scratching right. their heads. And they can maybe eke out a little bit more saturation in the other colors to help compensate uh, for what they're going to have to do with the green color. But yes, I, I think it's it's not us, dude. It's you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, um, I mean, if, if anything, people see uh, sometimes a bit of a bluish Blue. tinge or a purplish mm -hmm. tinge in yeah. the really dark colors, but not green. That that is unusual and it, it really might just be your eyes that is not he a might have a like a like a very mild case of like color blindness you know or I mean? just Where a you... yeah a bit of a uh what would you call it a chroma aberration and in, in, right in the way right. that i mean this this is entirely possible that you I are literally have never heard anybody say anything green. about green in yeah. the gray i've definitely heard, heard bluish this. i've definitely heard yeah. purplish yeah but green is unusual, and I imagine just altering the overall tint towards red wouldn't help because that would start to make everybody look, their skin look too red because that's what the, the tint control tends to do. So but, Okay, so remind me how, because I, I, I've had friends that are colorblind, but I can't remember. Isn't blue-green colorblind a thing, right? Absolutely. Sure. Could be it's the blue that he's seeing, but it is... It looks green to him? Green to him, mm -hmm. yeah. So mm -hmm. maybe try adjusting the blue color. Mm. might help and a professional calibrator could could really dial this in for you i mean but it, i would definitely tell him beforehand like listen this is my problem i think it's right. just me but i need somebody to calibrate the tv not correctly 
but to me. Mm-hmm. So that it looks right to me. And since it's only in the dark ranges, though, right? He didn't describe it as happening in the in the brighter yeah. ranges, only in the darks and the shadows and that. So that is something that you might be able to adjust with a more advanced color management system for sure, where you could yeah. uh, either decrease the green or increase the red to offset it only in the darker portions of the image. That is something that can be done. Um if you have only a two point color adjustment, it'll have it, you know, uh, the green, red, and blue yeah. gain and bias that might overdo things a bit too much. But if you have a 10 point or a 20 point adjustment, right. this is definitely something that you could do. But, um, I mean, does he really need, if he has access to those controls, does he really need a professional? Because couldn't he just kind of do it to taste? Because what else is the professional going to do? Their, their measurement gear isn't going to help them know what he is seeing with his eyes that's true i mean they're just going to know better how to adjust you know when he describes something right like they're going to know what to fix and then he can say well this is what it looks like to me and go from there but right 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 i mean i think he could actually kind of do this himself uh the the tcls are pretty decent they give you a color management system as long as you don't go into like service menus or anything like that. yeah don't go into service menu but yeah i mean only adjust the dark side and try reducing just the green or offsetting that by increasing the red just in the darks or like tom says maybe you do have a little bit of blue green color blindness for you know somehow and increasing the blue would actually help uh experimenting with it won't do any harm if you're just in the user menus do that to your heart's content so, yeah, right. I'd, I'd be in favor of that. But, yeah, as far as does everybody else see it, uh, no. I, nope. I have to say that that isn't a common thing. Sean and Luke, these are both from Twitter? Uh, Luke was on Twitter. Sean was okay. email. All right. Sean has been using his Vizio TV for about eight years now, and it belongs to its his in-laws before he had it, so the TV itself is even older than that. He's been saving up his pennies, and now he has a budget of about 2500 to spend on what we assume is a 65-inch 4K HDR TV. He wants it to look terrific, and he wants it to last. Mm-hmm. Nobody can help you with the last thing, but we'll try. It's going in the family room. There are windows, and but they have curtains, so there's definitely ambient light, but it's not blinding sunlight or any, uh, all the time or anything. His wife and his kids will be watching TV and movies on it, and he'll be playing Call of Duty. That's the only game he's allowed to play on it. If we give you this recommendation and you play any game other than Call of Duty, <laughs> it's your fault if the TV doesn't last. He's just letting us know that uh, that it, it is a shooters. mostly one-game situation for him. Okay. So <laughs> to keep that in mind. So uh, and so he's trying to decide which type of TV and what uh, which model to buy. The LG C8 OLED, the Sony X900F LCD, and the Samsung Q8FN QLED are all contenders. But various uh, opinions online, and of course the talk about burn-in uh, being possible in OLEDs, have him at the crossroads. Which TV should he buy? Okay, the only first of all, don't worry about burn-in. Uh, the only <laughs> L- the only LED OLEDs I've seen with burn-in are the ones that are at stores that have had logos up on them at yes. full brightness uh, all day long yeah constantly yeah i mean like like we said, we can't say that it's impossible to get burned on an ole because I, we have seen it it can currently, happen so your your phone right has yep. it's no. probably an oled screen almost all of them are these days right so my screen my oled screen on my phone has burn in mm-hmm. why does it have burn in because one maybe more than one day i left the, the screen on and i have like the shut off at like half an hour why because me and the family play Pokemon Go, and if you don't have it that half an hour or something, you have it less than that, it keeps shutting the screen off and screws mm-hmm. up the game, and it's a pain in the butt. So I turned it on, and I left it on, and I like put it face down on something, so it was just, bur- you you know, just, yep. just burning itself in there, and just and you know, whatever. Like one so, little row of icons that's always the same, uh, or whatever. The icon, yep, the icons at the top, and the two, it was on the, it was on the, it was on the, the home screen, so there was two buttons that had white backgrounds, and those two mm-hmm. buttons that had white backgrounds now have burn in. Do I say that all OLED burn in no i say that my I, my stupidness made my you know created burn it on my phone so but it's he's concerned it that he could be gaming for hours on end and it's all one game where it probably does have well, a heads-up display of some icons or does. he's got kids who might leave the tv on and pause it on a cartoon or as something long as they don't them. shift it to dynamic mode or whatever the the you know the torch mode you should be okay uh, i would have a hard i mean time. i i so he said in his case and OLED is like his top choice as far as picture quality goes. Okay. And I'm not worried about the like the whole thing about, oh, I've got light in my room. OLED's dark. I'm like, it's, OLEDs are so bright. It's yeah. such a dumb criticism. I, I thought that the um, Sonys were best with gaming, though. I thought Sonys were the best for the response, right? 
Uh, the Samsungs are right now. Oh, okay, Samsungs. Okay. Yeah, and the Samsungs have the variable refresh rate thing. If you've got an Xbox oh, right. or or you're gaming off a PC with an AMD card, because it's AMD FreeSync, or they can do the variable refresh rate with an Xbox One X. Um, so they have that. They probably are kind of the top gaming choice if that's your number one thing. I mean, for me, if I'm like. This is for nothing but a hardcore gamer. They're playing for hours and hours on ends. They've got a head up, heads-up display that's not going to move around on the screen, and they're not going to vary their content. And maybe they are going to pause the game and walk away for four hours and leave it up there. I'm like, yeah, a Q8 FN from Samsung is my top choice. It becomes my top choice. I don't think the Q9 FN is worth the greater price tag. Uh, I think the Q8 FN is, is the better choice pretty much full stop. And if that's too expensive, I'd go down to a Vizio, either a... Uh, P-Series Quantum, if you want the super bright and you want the quantum colors and all that, and you're willing to pay the highest price tag, and 65 inches is the only size you want, or I'd go down to a Vizio P-Series, because they have really low latency for gaming. They're great on that side. They just don't have the variable refresh rate, mm. but the price is also like half, so that seems a reasonable trade-off to me. They can even do 120 hertz at 1080p on the Vizios. So... Those are sort of the orders that I'd go in. But if you can vary the con, I mean, he says it's for a family room. I bet you're yeah. not viewing only on axis by yourself, at which point an OLED looks so much better when you're off axis. Uh, I, I mean, you have to answer. Do you know that you, when you're playing your game, are going to be disciplined enough where every hour and a half or so you take a little break and either put on a flashing test pattern or just switch to some other content or your TV or just turn the TV off and run the little the little scrolling bar that gets rid of any image retention. Are you disciplined enough to do that as you, the gamer? And do you trust that your kids aren't just going to pause on a cartoon and leave it there for five hours? Well, I mean, who else is in this house that these kids are pausing this TV and it's staying on there for five hours? So, but that yeah. happens, man. <laughs> I'm not saying it doesn't. I'm saying that it shouldn't. Right. But that's the question. Are you and your family disciplined enough to vary your content? Because if you are, get the OLED. I mean, it just, it looks better. It just, full stop, it just looks better. But if, if you're like, you know what? I'm too worried about it, and I think there is a chance, uh, and I don't think my entire family is disciplined enough to, to, to vary the content every hour, hour and a half or so, then yeah, go for an LCD. Uh, I do put the Q8FNs sort of at the top of that pile for gaming specifically, but... I don't think it's worth twice the price of a Vizio P series. I really don't. Mm. That that is by far the value choice. So I mean, uh, AV forums they're running a poll. They're like, of all the OLED owners, who's got burning? And it's like, well, one out of every three hundred or so has burning. <laughs> so it's not really that common. And then CNET wrote a whole article about OLED burning. They're like the same thing we said, right? It can happen, but if you vary the content, it won't. And then ratings put out like a ranking of what they think are the best gaming televisions. And it's like, well, the LG OLED, if you're not worried about burn-in, or the Vizio P Quantum, they actually put above even the Samsungs, unless you really want variable refresh rate, and then get a Samsung. So we're all sharing the same advice here. Uh, mm. But you do have to decide a little bit on knowing yourself and your family how you're going to use it. So along the same lines, Luke is looking for a new TV, and a PC gaming is a priority for him. Mm -hmm. That's led him to consider Samsung's TVs since they support AMD FreeSync and the variable for refresh rate for game consoles. But Luke is looking for the very best value. So he's wondering if Samsung is really worth more than, say, a Vizio P series or maybe an OLED. Is it worth it over all of them? And I think we just answered that. So. Yeah. I mean, the Vizio P series is the value choice for sure. I mean, yeah. if you're... If, if you're a... Game, uh, PC gamer and you've invested in a video card that can do the 120 hertz, then the Vizio P series can already accept that and it's only if the frame rate drops that you'd worry about the variable refresh rate. And heck, right. if you went in with an NVIDIA card, it's not going to work anyway on the Samsung because they only do AMD's FreeSync, so you'd have to limit yourself to AMD video cards. Um, yeah, I mean, th there's no getting around the value of Vizio's P series. That, right. That's the value choice. Infinite Gary. Like it or not, AK really does seem to be coming. There have been a number of recent AK cameras announced. NHK will be broadcasting dedicated AK satellite TV signal. Uh, channel, I'm sorry, t uh, TV channel starting December 1st. And mm -hmm. of course, Samsung recently launched their 8K Q900R QLED TV. And Sharp is on their second generation of 8K TVs in Asia. And as we mentioned in the news, LG will start mass producing 8K OLEDs this next year. Mm -hmm. But HDMI 2.1 isn't here yet. <laughs> so how are these cutting edge 8K devices being connected to one another? 
the power of positive thinking. Well, I LG mean, it, LG is waiting for HDMI 2.1 because that is supposed to be here by the end of next year as a mm-hmm. thing you can actually put in products. So I'm pretty sure LG is waiting for that. So everybody else end. is just up converting 4K then. Uh, Samsung is just up converting 4K. Now, Samsung, they have their external one connect box, right? Where right. you all your things plug into that box and then that box plugs into your TV so they can replace that external input box. That's how they're going to get around because they're like, yeah, we can't do HDMI 2.1 right now, but we can replace the external connect box. So there you go. We can give it to you later. Uh, the Sharps... I, I love the Sharps because the Sharps use four HDMI cables to input the 8K signal. That is how they are nice. doing that in Asia where they actually have some 8K sources. They're using four HDMI cables. So yeah, everybody's basically just waiting on it. Am I the it. only one who's always surprised when Sharp is still around? <laughs> oh, they're around. Whenever I hear I'm like, oh, Sharp makes TV. Is it Sharp's TV? I'm like, Sharp makes TV still? Man, I thought they were dead like when I started this job. <laughs> They are so old. <laughs> you know what's... Okay, No, we'll talk about this later after the podcast. But anyways, all right. So yeah, <laughs> that's it. That's it. That That's it. Yeah. So yeah, well, waiting for LG. Samsung's going to replace it. And Sharp has four HDMI cables. All right. Carlos. Carlos has a 5.2.4 speaker setup. He purchased Focal 700 series towers in the matching Focal center. Moved his DevTech Bipole towers towers to surround duty and went with four SVS Prime elevation speakers as front and rear heights. He's under the impression that we frown on using towers as surrounds. And I just made a face at that. So, yeah, maybe. Is that because of a bad experience or we just prefer using bookshelf speakers? No bad experience. It's just unusual. And there's no reason you can't do this. It used to be weird because people would do it and the recommendation was always put your surround speakers, you know, three feet above your head and two feet behind you. And everybody's like, how are you supposed to get a tower speaker there? But now that suddenly Dolby has revisionist (laughs) history going on and like, no, we never recommended that. We always wanted your side surrounds to be right at ear level. Now it makes more sense. It's just most people don't have surround sounds. I was actually, when I made that sort of, you know, Bipole towers. I was just surprised that they were towers, not that that they were bipole. I mean, that's one of DevTech's yeah. things. He's, yeah. yeah, it just it's just like you don't normally hear that. So uh, using them for surround duty, there's nothing wrong with it. Absolutely especially not. not now. Yeah, uh, it's uh, just usually not high enough. I mean, I, frankly, for most couches, unless you're going to be putting them directly on the side, and honestly, even if you are putting them directly on the side, we usually recommend elevating them so they have a direct line of sight for everybody's ears. Right. That's right. And most towers are not that tall. No, because that would be weird. I mean, they're meant to normally be front speakers where the tweeters are at ear level. That's that's yeah. sort of the aim, the goal. So, I mean, that's the only downside, if mm-hmm. you want to say. That and the cost. I mean, you could raise them up somehow, give them stands yeah. of some sort if you if you want to elevate them a bit. Uh, but yeah, yeah, I mean, normally if you're putting together a system from scratch, we wouldn't opt for tower surrounds because harder, harder position cost more for really no benefit. So why right. not get smaller speakers that you can wall mount or put on taller stands? The, all of that stuff makes satellite or bookshelf surround speakers easier if you're buying from scratch. But if you already had a pair of towers and you're moving them from front to surround duty because you already own them. Like, yeah, that's, that's totally fine. His subs are a pair of SVS SB16 Ultras. One of them is positioned as far as front right corner and the other is beside his couch on the left. He's using a Denon X4300H, so he ran um, Odyssey Multi-Q XT32 and he thinks the system sounds great. All right, question is over. <laughs> But he also has an SB13 Ultra that is now collecting dust. So he's curious what might happen if he incorporates it into a system most likely positioned beside his couch on the right. How would he go about hooking up three subs and how would he use multi uh, multi EQ XT32 in a three sub situation? So he has one sub plugged into each one of the subwoofer outputs and he's got a third sub. Correct. Uh, well, first of all, I wouldn't mm-hmm. <laughs> add, add the third sub in there. There's uh, all the research says even numbers is best two, four, six, eight. Right. If you know. if you're not doing a whole thing that I'm gonna get into a little bit, but if if you're just doing this via positioning and sending a mono signal to all subs, then even number of subs is the way to come at that. So the for does HSU still sell their mid base woofer? They stop selling that. Yeah, I'm pretty sure they stopped selling that mid base yeah. module of theirs. But th- that is what that, that if I was going to add a third subwoofer to my setup, oh. <laughs> that is how I would do it. Which well, is, I mean, I guess you could turn one of these SVS subs into a mid base module. I, I I would. I mean, first of all, I, I don't understand. There must be some reason he doesn't have his subs placed diagonally. Actual diagonally. Course. Yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah like any number must, of reasons could be. There must be some reason he's not doing that. But 
in my room, what I would do is I would put one in one corner or in the middle point of one wall one in the opposite corner of the opposite wall midpoint and then i would take the third subwoofer and put it probably right behind the couch mm. and use it as a mid-base woofer okay. so what the mid would mid with a mid-base woofers do they basically play like 50 to like 80 a, hertz is 50, 50 to 80 you know 50 drum. to 90 they play the kick drum yeah, yeah. so the, the, it sits right there then your subwoofers are there are then crossed over into from mm, that into yeah, the subwoofers yeah. which will then play everything below that so yeah i never really I, liked that i never really i never i never really liked it I never really thought it was necessary uh ray coronado does it and thinks it sounds great sure. so you know whatevs but uh no i would not just s- just put a third subwoofer in here. I mean, you could try it. There's a couple right. of ways to do it. You yeah. could take one of your subwoofer outputs, probably the one that's at, on the side of your couch, and you could Y split it. Sure. So the and, the subs that are on either side of your couch would be getting the same signal. And, then and that way, you right you know that those subs are almost certainly, unless your your couch is off-centered, almost certainly equidistant from the the number one right mic from positions. the middle seat sure so there will be no no reason to worry about distance you just have to make sure each one's set at the same volume level mm-hmm. not on the dial but you to calibrated ears. yeah yeah calibrated to the to the right volume level so they're both coming out the same volume and then they can be eq'd by odyssey as one uh, you could also like triple y split off of one mm-hmm. and then have all three of them getting the mono signal yeah and make sure that each one is calibrated to the same we have volume level. No idea if that'll help or harm, though. The, the, yeah, that's the problem. Yeah. Is that you adding this third subwoofer? If, especially since you say, "I think it sounds good." If you have an <laughs> SVS subwoofer uh, collecting dust, sell it. Yes, someone sell will it. buy an SB13 <laughs> Ultra. I guarantee someone will buy an SB13. Rob Ultra. might drop down, drive down from <laughs> Vancouver to get it. <laughs> Not quite. I have I have a pair of PC13 Ultras. I'm set. But uh, no, no, someone don't, will yeah, buy that. There's no yeah. question. Absolutely. Um, Okay, but let's just say, let, let's say it might not even be him. Uh, let's say somebody else wants to do a three subwoofer setup. What would be, I don't know, I guess I'll say optimal or, or more advanced way of connecting it all. Um, you could do with a mini DSP 2x4, which is a $95 device, so that's not too bad. Uh, you will need a microphone, uh, measurement microphone as well to go along with that. And the free Herb, Herb over at uh, Cross Spectrum Labs will hook you up with that's that. That's right, and the free Room EQ Wizard software. Uh, but then you'll want to use another piece of free software, which is the multi-sub optimization software. It's free, so why not use it? And what it does is it uh, you'll take a bunch of measurements from a bunch of different positions, uh, each sub indivi- individually in its position, and then you have a couple of choices uh, within the multi-sub optimization software. You can say, try to just give me the flattest response from each and every sub individually, which is kind of a weird way to do it, but some people are doing like actual stereo subs and stuff like that. So they go for that. Or the one that we're going to recommend, which is try to make every seat uniform. And then you're still going to end up using Odyssey on top of that. It's just going to be a global equalizer at that point. So the way this all works is the multi-sub optimization software will walk you through taking all the measurements and then you tell it, what I want you to do is crunch the numbers so that I have uniformity across all of the seats. And it is going to then spit out a bunch of filters into the mini DSP that are unique to each of the three subs. It's going to give each of the three subs different gain, different delay, different EQ for each of them. But when they all play together, you're supposed to end up with nice uniform response across all of your seats. Then you'll have one, you'll tell your AV receiver that you have one sub. You're going to connect that one subwoofer output to the mini DSP. That's going to feed the three subwoofers out of the mini DSP. And as far as Odyssey is concerned, it's EQing one subwoofer, but that one subwoofer now has very uniform response across all of your seats. So it can give you one global EQ very nicely. So that's the more advanced way to do it. it it's very effective. It does work. It's more time and effort to set it up, and you have to buy a few things in the form of the mini DSP and the measurement mic. But uh, yeah, that'd be the way you or could do it. You could just sell that third sub. Or and you could just sell that third and sub. Be and be with very it. happy with what already <laughs> sounds excellent to you, and have more money in your pocket instead of less. He's got an Emotiva XPA3 amplifier to power his front three speakers. Since his setup is a 5.2.4, he set his Denon's amp assigned to 9.2, and everything seems to be working fine with the XPA3 connected to the Denon's pre But reading through the manual, it mentions how if he sets the amp assigned to 11.2, he'll be able to send the pre to front LR. 
Should he do that? Wait, what? Yeah, it if gives you an additional setting. It gives you an additional pre-out setting if you yeah. set the amp assigned to 11.2. Uh, but you don't need to do that, all right? I don't uh, see why. If it's working, if all the speakers are yeah. working, then I thought we'd just walk away. <laughs> so all the, all the pre-outs on the Den and Navy receivers, they're hot all the time. Right. So it's not as though you have to activate the pre-outs. The, pre the pre-outs are always outputting a signal. The amplifier assigned, so in the case he has, what, X4300H, you said? Uh, yeah. So that one has nine amplifiers built into it, but it can process 11 speakers. That means if you do choose an 11.2 setup, then two of those speakers have to be powered externally. Right. right. You can't power all 11 internally. It doesn't have 11 amps. So the preamp, the pre-out assign when you've amplifier assigned as 11.2, that's just saying which two of these speakers have to be powered externally. Tell yeah, me which two. Your options will be 11, uh, front, left, and right, or top middles. Top, <laughs> yeah, top middle or top rears, whichever you have. Right, right. Because I try, I try to do top fronts with them. They're like, nah. Nope. <laughs> front left right or top rears or in the case of Tom's set of top middles so th that's just saying these are the ones that have to be powered externally everything else you have the option you can power them internally with the nine remaining amps or the pre-outs are still hot you can power them with external amps too so in your case you're maxing out at nine speakers either way doesn't matter you can power all nine with the internal amps or power any or all of them externally as well you don't have to change any settings Chris. Chris is trying to help a friend decide on a 2.1 speaker setup for about 800 bucks. Mm -hmm. $500 for us. So. At the moment, he's uh, it's for a computer setup in his office, but there's a chance his friend will want to move the speakers out into his living room. So he's just looking for computer, excuse me, speakers. He already has an external USB DAC for his computer, so he can just use pre-outs and control the volume uh, from there. Therefore, Chris is thinking he just needs to amplify a pair of speakers in the sub. Yep. Chris uses HSU's HB1 Mark II speakers in his own desktop setup, which are that's ridiculously large speakers to be sitting that close next to, but whatever. <laughs> so he immediately thought uh, to recommend those along with the HSU VTF1 and maybe an Emotiva amplifier, but what would we recommend? I mean, uh, what, what he just proposed is already over $800. Yeah, so I was going to say. That's yeah. an issue. <laughs> um, which so he needs the Emotiva amplifier to go with this. Emotiva amplifiers are how much? I mean, he in his email he suggested the A one hundred and fifty, and I'm like, that's a three hundred dollar amplifier yeah, for a go. desktop two channel setup. That's so seems it, it, like crazy if you're crazy. Going with something uh, that you might move into another room, you're going to need right. more full size speakers. So right. I like the idea of uh, the RSL Speedwoofer, which is what four hundred bucks. Yeah, four hundred right? bucks for that RSL Speedwoofer ten S. Coming up again. Yep. And then I'm thinking uh, one of the Focal bird okay. things because they can be on desktops. They can be wall mounted. Could. They have plenty of output for a room. And if he decides to stretch his budget, he could go for the super birds and get the big ones mm. or get the birds or the little birds. And yeah. if the little birds, and he could end up, birds. he could put use them as surrounds later on if he decides. That's very and, true. Yeah, so the then, little birds you can get from accessories for less for $100 each. So that'd be $200. $200, $600. So we've got uh, $200, $200 left over for, for amplifier. amplification. Definitely doable. Or if you go with the, uh, the Focal birds, just birds, those are $150 each. So that'd be $300 for the pair, leaving you $100 for the amplifier. So you is, have to go with that the amp I have. Yeah, the Dayton, the APA 102, yeah. which would be absolutely fine. 90 bucks from Parts Express. So that could that could totally get the job done. You could go with that Dayton amplifier. Uh, yeah. Now I'm I'm thinking very much along the same lines. I was like NHT's Super Series yep. is another sure. one. I like in a desktop setup a sealed speaker design. To me, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Um, so the Super Zeros are $125 each, so $250 for the pair, or the Super Ones are $175 each, so that's $350 for the pair. So. Yeah, the Super Zeros would certainly for, uh, fit. You could also consider a Sens HTM 200 SEs. Those are also right. sealed. Those are also $300 a pair. So you're noticing a pattern here. We're going somewhere in the $250 to $300 for a pair of sealed smaller speakers, which absolutely still could be used in another what room. What do the RBH bookshelves go for these days? I am not sure. I'd have to look that up. They're not sealed and they're bigger. So I know. I don't care about that. Yeah. 
I don't know. I like smaller and sealed. So yeah, all of those, the Focals, the SNs, the NHTs. Um, when I thought this was just a computer setup, uh, there are those Vanatu speakers, the transparent ones or the transparent zeros. And one nice thing there is they actually have a subwoofer output on them with a crossover. Right. So in all of these scenarios that we've described so far, we haven't introduced a subwoofer crossover. Uh, because the Dayton amplifier wouldn't be giving a subwoofer for crosser. So I have a potential solution for that, which is Monoprice has this teeny tiny little two-channel amplifier with a subwoofer crossover built into it. And it's just a passive amplifier, but it does come with a little remote, so you can change the volume directly on this little amplifier. And it has a subwoofer with, uh, they actually set it to a 120 hertz crossover, but you know what? With the smaller sealed speakers, that's not necessarily such a bad thing. So... I'm very okay with that. The only thing is it's $180 for that little monoprice right. amp. So it's it's a little bit spendy, but it could certainly fit. Like if you got the Focal Little Birds and the RSL Speedwoofer and this monoprice amplifier, that would totally work. The RBHs are 150 each. For the so 300 bucks for the pair. <laughs> yeah. put, those, put those on the list too. <laughs> so. I mean, so if his friend was willing to go over budget and he was going to spend $300 on an amplifier. You do have the option. It's not even available just yet, but we know it's coming, which is Amazon's Echo Link Amp. Right. Because uh, that also has a dedicated subwoofer output with a crossover on it. It is $300, uh, but not only could you plug in your computer system and all that, now you've got it uh, connected to your network and you can do like all your streaming music via voice commands and all that kind of stuff. So, But that puts you over budget if, if, if you're going $300 for the Amazon Echo Link amp. But several options there. Yeah. I think something out of that will work. All right, this might. I don't know how much longer we're gonna go. I got. I have like to get to work. <laughs> I haven't done any work today. <laughs> Kevin on Facebook. Kevin has a, a bit of gear lust, and he wonders what we think of the Viva Audio Credenza modular horn loaded speaker system. Kevin is really smitten with the way it looks and imagines it would sound amazing too. Are we taking with his appearance and design as he is? Are you gonna be mad if I say no? because that's kind of the way I feel about this thing. Uh, the super tweeters on top immediately turned me on uh -huh, to, to begin uh -huh. with. Um, the, the essentially having a, you know, a front, you know, a subwoof, two subwoofers in the front right near your gear seems like a weird idea. <laughs> that's poor placement. not optimal placement for, <laughs> uh, for subwoofer drivers. No, no. No, I, I, there's really th this okay now am i smitten with this looks i think it looks kind of cool but i think it's not gonna look nearly as cool when you cover all that stuff on the bottom up with the speaker grill cloth which you're <laughs> surely supposed to do i don't and know then, man i don't think you're supposed to cover any of that up none of the photos have it covered up and then they have those big horns on top so none of your real estate on top of your credenza so the way this thing looks so you, you know if you take like a really wide uh component cabinet for your uh for your gear that you would put your TV on top. Sure. Yeah. On either side, there's, you know, popping out of the the, the, the top like ET's head or horn loaded tweeters, it looks like. Yep. And on top of that, there's a little, you know, brass gold colored super tweeter. It's, it's got to be a super tweeter. Oh, I yeah. mean, it's got to be. The, the, the fact that it's so far back from the front baffle of that other thing just <laughs> makes it just reflects right off the top of the thing. You know, what? I don't even know what you think that's going to do. But then again, it's not making sound you can hear anyways. Then inside the cabinet, it's mostly a mid-range, a horn-loaded mid-range, mm -hmm. it looks like. And then towards the inside, there are two what look like 12-inch, I'm going to say, 12-inch drivers with four front-facing oh, ports. Heck, those might be 15s for all we know. Yeah. No, nah, it can't be 15s. And then it it, and then between those two things, there's just enough space to put a very, not even full-size receiver, it looks like, <laughs> on three little, little things. In fact, the amplifier they're using to power these things, which, of course, is all full of tubes and crap, uh, is sitting on top where you would put your TV, mm -hmm. which can't be wider than, like, Maybe a 55 inch. Yeah, it's either going to be mounted very high to clear the tops of those super tweeters, or it's going to be uh, not the. Well, I, I mean, they say this thing is like can be bespoke, so I'm sure you can get it made wider than this, but. Uh, sure, that's what you want. Yeah. How are you going to get it in the door? <laughs> uh, no, I agree. Kevin, I'm sorry. I mean, I, it, it is very. It's a very interesting industrial throwback design. Then, you know, my parents had something similar to it. It had a record player on that you would open at sure. the top. Right, right, right. To get to it was a piece of furniture and this is just you know i 
you look at it and you think, wow, that looks amazing. Yeah. And I look at it and I say, wow, that looks like it would sound really bad. Yeah, you I know, mean, that, that, acoustics wise, I'm like, well, that's not where I'd want to position any of my drivers, the, really. I mean, I guess maybe the mid ranges are, I don't know. The, the yeah. tweeters, I think, are even too, too uh, low. Low, you know, compared well, to what you European seating. Could be. But then again, like, God forbid you have to, like, tow in your speakers yes you're totally screwed be an issue and yeah you're at the mercy of whatever bass is being produced by that thing yeah uh no i i can't say i'm definitely not as smitten as you this this doesn't get me all revved up in in pretty much any regard (laughs) it's it's not to my like but you know what i have zero problem with you looking at that going hey i really like the look of that because yeah by all means man if you love the way that looks that's cool yeah but don't you know, it's like anything like those avant-garde speakers. And if you don't know what those are, you should look them up. They, they're just huge horns. Yeah. I mean, if you're choosing like, between this or a Lamborghini, because that's about how much it costs, get the Lamborghini. This thing costs a Lamborghini? Dude, these are like $300,000 speakers. You <laughs> <laughs> lost your freaking mind. $300,000. I You should just build the house around it for me. You know, I, I, the speakers come with the house. You buy the ha- you buy the speakers, you get a house. Shut up. $300,000. <laughs> this, you know what? If you had said $20,000, I would have been like, you lost your mind. I mean, if you look at the website, there are no specs at all. <laughs> they only Who talk needs about specs when you the spend look and the bespoke. And, oh, by the way, you won't get the full sound quality unless you also buy their amplifiers, of course. Oh, you know what? That uh, The speakers themselves are just a little line in the in the thing. You can sp- yeah? you can move those speakers so it's not one continuous yeah, cabinet. Yeah. Oh, yeah. They, they show a couple of different configurations. Oh, well, so. I'm only just seeing So it's here. modular, you see? Oh, well, that makes it worth $300,000. <laughs> For three hundred thousand dollars, you can literally pay somebody to build you a speaker, As, yeah, custom. Exactly. I mean, go to Sulk; they'll build you something real nice for that amount of money. <laughs> for three hundred thousand dollars, Mister Sulk himself, Jimmy, go, will be at your a, house. Go to Ascend; I guarantee you, Dave Fabricant will be like, "Yeah, I can design you something for that kind of." Budget. And you're like, "I want it to look like this, but I want it to sound good." You go, "Well, do you mind if I put fake woofers in it? I don't care." There we go; three hundred thousand dollars. Just they're not real. You can afford those three thousand uh, dollar synthetic diamond tweeters that Dave really likes. Absolutely for that budget. Yeah. Greg, all right, this is our last one. I really do have Ooh, to get okay. to work. Short podcast. Greg's, uh, it's okay. Greg says he found AV wrenches a couple of weeks ago and he loves it. He's been listening uh, almost nonstop in reverse chronological order and he's almost done with our twenty eighteen episodes already. Well, Greg, thank you. It's a lot of listening, but yes, thank you. Thank you for being a fan. His family of six are moving to a new house, and there's a finished room in the basement that will become his theater. It's 16 by 22, plus a hallway at the back that leads to the stairs. There's a door at the top of the stairs, uh, the door to close off all the other rooms in the basements, I guess. So there are doors. Okay. There are doors. This is, yeah, it's not a wide open space, but it's not exactly a perfect rectangle because there's a hallway in the on the back wall in the right all right, he's planning to hang a heavy curtain over the hallway entrance, although that probably will alter the total volume of air as far as the base is concerned, correct? Correct. That's fine. But, it, you know, whatever. It looks good. So he's playing two rows of seats, and he's given us uh, some diagrams here, but it really is just a rectangle. And the back right, on the back right wall, so if you're yeah. sitting down uh, over your right shoulder on the wall, right in the corner is the is the exit to go to the... the um, Stairs there. Yeah. He's playing on two rows of seats, and both rows will get frequent use. So as much as possible, we'd like every seat to be a good seat. He's got $3,500 Canadian, uh, and that needs to cover both audio and video equipment, projector screen, AV receiver, five speakers, and a sub. Five speakers? He's been working... One sub? He's been working on allocating his budget for weeks, and his plan left him with $700 Canadian for subwoofers. That, okay. that was his plan. He's like, I've got the projector, the screen, the AV receiver, the speakers, and this is what I'm left with. $700 Canadian for subwoofers. That could buy him a single SVS PB1000, but not duals, which costs 1280 Canadian. Listen to us. He knows he wants even base across both rows of seats. He's really trying to figure out how he can get dual subs, but the budget is fixed. There won't be additional money in the, for the home theater in the future. And he's in Canada where the price tags are higher and there aren't quite as many options. So he needs to buy everything now in one shot. But he still needs to be within budget and hopefully look and sound great. To help him out, what gear can he buy to accomplish his goals? Should he just get a single PB1000 hope for the best? Well, we don't know what else the rest of the stuff is, right? He didn't He didn't provide a list of everything else he was considering. So I went through 
uh, Canadian sources and what I would put together for $3,500 for this room, uh, knowing that he wants, you know, the best experience he can across all of the seats and that Are all of the seats in, will be used. Yeah, we got to factor in the, the riser for the second seat. I bet he didn't factor that in. No, he didn't ask for that to be part of the budget. I bet he didn't factor it in. Those people are going to be looking around there. Everybody else's that. head's going, I can't see. I mean, he didn't I can't talk see. about room treatments being part of the budget either, and I would love to have room treatments in here, but... I mean, it, this is a challenge, all right? I'm already, <laughs> I'm already scraping a little bit to get all the things that he mentioned for $3,500. I mean, maybe he can say acoustic treatments are part of the decoration because you can get printed panels. So, you know, maybe you can fit into the decor budget if there is one. I don't know. Maybe there's a construction budget for this room, and that's where the riser fits in. I mean, the, the chairs have to come from somewhere. Maybe the riser and the acoustic treatments can be rolled into the cost of the recliners. You get slightly less expensive seats or something. Right, Ways so he only wants five point one, and the the first AV receiver that has uh, Odyssey Multi QXC thirty two is what the thirty three thousand series, right? Yeah, the thirty four hundred H, which you can get as B stock from Gibby's. Uh, Gibby's gets their their B stock directly from Denon, much like Accessories for Less does in the states. Gibby's is the place to go in Canada, and they do have uh, the X thirty four hundred H as B stock for five hundred and thirty Canadian dollars, which is really darn good because it's five hundred dollars American. Hey, was that was that that maxes out at what like seven point one? That maxes out at driving seven speakers, but he said okay. he wants five, so. You, you could still add a pair of ceiling speakers to make it 5.2.2 Atmos. You can still do that. 16 by 22, right? 16, 16 by, 22, by 22. So you could do surround backs. You could have a 7.2 yeah. in here. But that yeah. more money for speakers. So, Okay. But $530 can get it for you. Now, I, again, I said I'm uh, scraping, and I'm not exactly sure how much the projector I'm going to recommend will cost because I know how much you can get it for for sure, but there might be a way to get save like about $100. Um, okay. So if you need to save money on the A receiver... Uh, you could go down to, even down to the AVRX 1400H. Again, Gibby's has that as B stock. They have that model for 320 Canadian dollars. So that's a couple hundred bucks you could save. Now that does drop you down to Odyssey Mult EQ XT, but that's still pretty good. Right. Nothing wrong with that. You have a, you don't have uh, multiple HDMI outputs, but he didn't talk about having multiple displays. So, sure. And uh, not as many HDMI inputs, but I don't know, is six enough? Hopefully. So X1400H could definitely be a possibility for 320 Canadian dollars. Okay. Projector. Really only one choice, in my opinion. That's Ben Q's HT2050 or the HT2050A, which is the current model. Now, you can for sure get that for 950 Canadian dollars because Amazon and Best Buy both sell the Ben Q HT2050A for $950. But. There's a great place in Canada called East Porters. So it's eastporters. Actually, I think they're a .com instead of a .ca. But anyway, East Porters, pretty much all they sell is projectors, and they usually have better prices than Best okay. Buy. So they don't list the price on their website. It's a whole, you have to call them and get the price, which probably means it's lower. That's what I'm hoping. So they do list the price for some package deals of projectors plus screens. So looking at the prices of some of the projectors they do, do list <laughs> plus a screen which i'm sure they're discounting a little bit so i'm not going to recommend getting a screen from them because they only sell more expensive screens and you can't afford that um but it looks like they are willing to sell the ht2050 for about 800 or 850 dollars so you might be able to save about 100 dollars versus best price price on the projector that'd be really nice if you could uh screen I'm wondering if you might go DIY on the screen, to be honest, because you can get DIY fabric, screen fabric from Elite Screens on Amazon. Okay. And I'm thinking a 120 or a 135 inch screen size would be really nice. And you can get Elite Screens fabric in those sizes already pre-cut and everything, and you would just make your own frame. And that would save you a good couple hundred dollars because you're looking at... Three hundred and fifty to four hundred dollars, depending on what the about size. About that, Alune Vision. I thought Alune Vision. Was yeah, but they're way more then. expensive. Okay. They they okay. start at about seven hundred dollars and go up from okay. there. So you can't get Silver Ticket. Like, well, you can, but you have to pay for the shipping and everything, which defeats the entire purpose. Mm. So, like, three hundred and fifty to four hundred dollars can get you an Elite Screens, the full screen, the frame, and everything. You can get that right on Amazon, and that's about the least expensive you could go. But if you can. Just get the fabric and build your own frame. Again, you can save a couple hundred dollars that way. Uh, okay, so speakers. Um, Pioneer Andrew Jones. That's what I'm going to recommend. Gibby sells them. 
And you can get the whole 5.0 speaker package with the tower fronts, which would be appropriate for this room size and multiple seating and everything. Uh, $650 for the 5.0 package from Gibby's. So that's not too bad. Um, that's, that's Canadian, again. Uh, so if you did all that, guess how much money you have left? <laughs> you have about uh, 1300 to $1,500 left just for subs. You can get the right. pair of PB1000s, which are absolutely what I would recommend to you. So I scrimped, I scrimped on everything, but you can get the subs. And you know what the subs are? They're the foundation of everything. <laughs> like, I don't, I don't want to skimp on the subs. Now, I know. if you I have to, if you have to, Gibby's sells Klipsch's subs. And the R12 is not too bad. Now, they, like, Klipsch is very honest. They're like the minus three decibel, decibel point of the R12 is 29 hertz. Not fantastic, but they're $500 Canadian, which also isn't fantastic. I'm like... $300 more, you can get a pair of PB1000s and really drive 20 hertz for all of your seats. And I, I got you there by skimping a little bit on the speakers and the receiver what, and um, all the rest. The size of this room is 22 by 16. That's what he said. Yeah. PBs are so big. No, but come on, man. That's, yeah. pro, that's per, PB1000s, not 2000s. Uh, yeah. Yeah. It's what okay. you want. It's what you want. So he's like, his wife knows the total budget. She doesn't know the component cost for any of these things. I'm like, you don't have to tell her. Like the Pioneer Angie Dome speakers, nobody's going to think those are cheap speakers just by looking at them. They look nice. Those are perfectly decent speakers. And they is sound that your, good too. Is that your yeah, sirens are fire department off. going by? Or I'm sorry, that whatever. <laughs> All right. Who do we have left? We only got a couple left. Yes, we only have a couple left. And those are Josh L. and Galen. You're on the list for next week and shall be answered. All right. We want to thank our uh, listeners of the week. We want to thank Paul and Greg for going to www.avrant.com and clicking on the Buy Us a Cup of Coffee link, sending us a pay PayPal donation. And we want to thank our 73 patrons over at patreon.com. Thank you, guys and gals. Yeah, Paul, Greg, thank you both very much for those PayPal donations. Thanks so much to our 73 patrons over at patreon.com slash avrantpodcast if you'd like to sign up and replace the two people we lost. Oh, I'm so sad. <laughs> I just want to thank Lee for filling in for me last week, 2A for fixing our website, Patrick uh, for letting us know about Google Music being stupid, and uh, Jerry, Terry, I'm sorry, for talking us up to um, projector people and maybe even JVC. I wasn't sure about Sounds that. Sounds about right. Part. Yeah. So thank you guys. Yeah, Terry, big congrats on that RS540 purchase because that's a super nice projector. Uh, Patrick, thanks very much for the heads up. I, I think Google Music is fixed now. Looks like it. And uh, 2A awesome that the website actually stayed live for an entire month this time and of course thanks lee always fun when you fill in all right for av rant i'm tom mandry and i'm rob h now go out and listen to something once your question answered send it to question at avrant.com is A.V. Rant. Now go out and listen to something.